everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD for July 10th, 2019. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce, and with me today is Tom O'Halloran, Partner and Portfolio Manager of Lord Abbott. Thanks for being here, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the markets, the revolution of the brain, and current stocks. Uh, but first, what I want to do is get into a little bit of your background, Tom, mm -hmm. uh, and how you got into investing. And really, the first question is, you know, who are some of your mentors uh, that helped you get into investing? Okay, well, I didn't get into the investment business until I was 33 years old. I uh, had a prior career as a trial lawyer. I was a criminal prosecutor for the state of Rhode Island. I left law at age 30 uh, to go to Wall Street. I did not think I would be an investor. I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't. My I had never owned a stock. And I went to Columbia Business School, and as luck would have it, my first job was in the venture capital group of a great firm by the name of Dylan Reed. And I worked there in that department for five years, and I just got hooked on growth investing. Most investors uh, that I had met in business school were value investors, but I just thought growth investing was far more exciting. And then uh, in year five, at the end of year five, the firm moved me over to the equity research department. So at, uh, at age, uh, uh, this is 1993, so at age 38, um, I had my first exposure to the public markets. And um, I began reading about great investors like I had read about great investors, great lawyers in, in law school to, to learn how to be a, a trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I read about uh, a, a, a great investor by the name of Stan Druckenmiller, who I had gone to Bowdoin with. He was an acquaintance um, in the game room where I used to shoot pool to drown my loneliness. And he was, at this point, very famous. And I read about uh, him in one of the Jack Schlager books on great investors and read about how he used technical analysis. And I thought, boy, this is intuitively very uh, sensible and uh, seems like a lot of fun. And yeah. this was 1993, and, and Stan by this point was, was you know, a billionaire, and I, I didn't want to bother him. Uh, but I did have uh, access to a great newspaper called Investor's Business Daily, which combined growth investing with technical analysis. So I picked up my first issue of Investor's Business Daily in 1993, and I've read 99% of the issues uh, since. It used to be a daily, which was uh, very time-consuming. Now it's uh, a, a weekly, and it's the very first thing I do on Saturday morning. Now, I did finally make my way to uh, managing money in 2003 at Lord Abbott, where I have been for 18 uh, years, another wonderful old firm uh, with a great uh, uh, culture. And uh, I joined there in 2001 as a technology research analyst. And, I, and I, I really did 14 years of marine boot camp training and research before I got to manage money. And yeah. that was a big advantage. And so I never really worked for a growth investor for a long period of time. I worked for a couple of gentlemen for a couple of years who were very helpful, but I didn't, I didn't have a mentor. I had to search for a mentor, and that mentor uh, from afar was William O'Neill uh, because he combined growth investing with technical analysis. And, um, and so he was hugely influential uh, to my career. No, that's amazing. We we actually both had the same mentor from afar, and uh, now yeah, Lord Abbott, you're you're currently a, a partner and portfolio manager, and you have a number of strategies uh, and, and a few funds too. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure, it's really a a great uh, uh, situation at Lord Abbott. I have a wonderful team. Um, uh, it's a great firm, great people. And I get to manage um, all the way from micro cap up to mega cap. Uh, we have a micro cap growth, a small cap growth, um, and the large cap growth, and now a new large cap focus growth fund. And and so this uh, the 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 ability to manage uh, 500 million dollar companies to a trillion dollar uh, 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 market value companies. 
uh, just gives you much more perspective and um, is a big advantage. Now, there were three mutual funds for these strategies. There's the Lord Abbott Microcap Growth Fund. There's the Developing Growth, which is the small cap strategy. And there is the Growth Leaders strategy, which is for large cap, and now a focused growth, which is large cap focus. And mm-hmm. I have a team of, uh, of six people. Uh, five of us um, I consider to be fundamental analysts, and one is a full-time uh, technician. Um, uh, three, of, three of us uh, are portfolio managers, uh, Matt DeSico and Vern Bice, along with me. And Vern uh, focuses on the technicals, and Matt's uh, our healthcare guru as well. And I double as a generalist analyst, but most of our investments can be found in consumer discretionary, healthcare, and technology, because that's where most of the uh, uh, investments are, are. That's where most of the innovation from the tech revolution is expressing itself. Um, I also uh, have the luxury of having a dedicated trader um, who knows, uh, you know, our process and philosophy. And and so um, um, it's it's a very exciting uh, job. I love what I do, and I think it's going to be great for another 10 years or more. That that's incredible. Now let's let's move on to the current market. So right now we're in an uptrend, and with IBD big picture, we currently have three distribution days on the Nasdaq, two on the S and P 500. We hit all time highs on the Nasdaq today. Uh, leading stocks are acting well, and uh, something you mentioned back in 2014, uh, you felt that we were uh, just starting a larger uh, secular bull market. What are your thoughts on that right now? Yes, I think this is a a, uh, a long-tailed bull market. I think the uh, the stocks are going to go up for the next two decades. We will likely have um, three to six bear markets along the way over those next two decades, but I don't think we're going to have anything as bad as we had in 2000 or 2008, yet everybody assumes those are right around the corner. This market still has a lot of skepticism, even though it's hitting all-time highs, uh, which for me is a good thing. I think we're going to go higher in the second half of the year. Next year, with the elections uh, at the end of 2020, could be more challenging. Next year might be a flat year. But for the balance of this year, I think we're going to go higher. And the reason is that the technology revolution is enabling growth like never before. Um, it is also lowering the rate of inflation, which um, means that we have lower interest rates. And as I look at the stock market, not only do I like that the fact that we're touching 3,000 in the S&P, but I see a multitude of uh, great growth companies that have great stock patterns. So at the moment, I'm, um, I'm, I'm bullish, short and long term. And now one thing that I, I listened to you uh, in, back in New York in April, I, I was at the CMT Association event, the symposium there. You're one of the keynote speakers, and I heard you speak, and that was the first time I heard you about, talking about IBD, how big an influence it was uh, on your life. And uh, now how do you incorporate the IBD big picture into your strategy, or how does the team incorporate it into the decision-making process? Well. I would say, you know, we'll talk about my uh, our philosophy and process in a moment, but I would say that um, whenever we're looking at a company or we're looking at a stock, we have to have a sense of the bigger picture. Uh, so when looking at a company, we have to have a sense of what's going on in the industry. Uh, when we're looking at the market, at, a, at the stock price, we have to se- have a sense of the overall health of the market. And uh, we have a great fixed income franchise at Lord Abbott um, who, who, who attach greater weight to the macro picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and I benefit from a close collaboration with them. And, um, and IBD is also an extremely valuable uh, source uh, of information to give me a sense of where the market is going. Um, you mentioned distribution days earlier. That, that those are signals that things might be changing for better or for worse. There are follow-through days uh, that tell you when a market is resuming an uptrend. No bull market has ever begun without a follow-through day. 
uh, right. for example, although many follow-through days fail. Yes. Uh, but the follow-through day on April uh, uh, 9, 2009, was the very near the very bottom of the market, and that was a great signal to get very aggressive for us. And similarly, in January of, of, of this year, there were follow-through days that provided a great signal to get uh, more aggressive. So we're fully invested as a mutual fund. Cash is, you know, rarely goes above 3% and certainly not 5%. But if the market is getting hostile to growth stocks, which it does 20% of the time by my estimate, Mm -hmm. um, we can fade defensively into, um, you know, more defensive types of stocks, um, up to 25% of the portfolios, generally speaking. But for the most part, our, 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 our belief is that we should be investing in these disruptive companies that are benefiting from the tech revolution and owning them while they are working as stocks, because you need to remember that Amazon fell 95% in 2000, right. Netflix fell 80% in 2012, etc. Uh, right. These stocks that can go up 10 to 1,000 times, when they go through their consolidations or corrections, it's not down 10%, it's, it's normally down 25 to 75%. And when that happens, you try to reduce exposure to, to those names. Perfect. So the market continues to be in an uptrend and a number of leading stocks are acting better underneath the surface. Let's take a quick break, but when we return, we will talk about a revolution of not only technology, but also of the brain. Stay tuned. Hi, everyone. First, I want to thank all of you for listening to the podcast and your support. And I wanted to let you know that we want to hear your thoughts. And if you have questions for us, we will answer them on the podcast. Email us at investingpodcast at investors.com. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe on your podcasting platform. We're back with Tom O'Halloran on Investing with IBD. And Tom, before we get into the tech revolution, let's first talk about your investment process. Okay. I we, we start off with a philosophy that the disruption that the tech revolution is creating is vastly underestimated, both in terms of the good opportunity for growth companies and the bad uh, destruction for existing businesses. We also mm -hmm. believe that momentum is very underestimated. That's where the technical analysis comes in. So that's our philosophy, is we're trying to exploit that. And the process can be thought of as three steps, and they're really very interactive. Uh, sometimes the last can go first, et cetera. So the, pr the process is that we try to own fine businesses. Um, the more disruptive, the better. Um, and what we mean by a good business is, first, that it has a good business model. The more profitable, the better. The more profitable it can get from where it is now, or scalability, the better. The more annuity-like it can be, the better. Secondly, we think that the people that run the business are very critical. So we want managements that are competent and credible. Thirdly, we believe free market capitalism benefits a few winners in each market. So we want the leader. And then fourthly, we want to make sure that the industry conditions are healthy. Um, it's fascinating to go through the investor business daily history of the stock market over the past 100 years and look at what some of the leading groups were in the 50s and the 60s, things like bowling alleys and um, amusement parks and things like that. And, right. and, and now it's software and, and biotech, et cetera. But we want to make sure that the industry is healthy. Then we want to make sure that that good business is operating in a healthy manner. So we look at sales growth. We look at earnings growth. Sometimes growth can get too fast and then crash and then revive again. But while it crashes, it turns, makes it a bad stock. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we want the, the, the business momentum to be healthy to enable this fine business to be a good stock. And then the third thing we do is we make sure that the stock price is cooperating. We like to own stocks that are going up 
and we don't like to own stocks that are going down. Now, we have a team of six people, and we're constantly reviewing the fundamentals. We get very deep on the fundamentals. We're a fundamental research-driven active management firm. Um, And my job on the team is to stimulate an active discussion, not to achieve a consensus, but to try to get the right answer on every buy and sell decision we're doing. We're going to make a lot of mistakes, but when we do, we need to correct them. We really need to check our egos at the door. It's not about whether Tom's right or Matt's right or Vern's right. It's whether we get the right decision and perform well. And I think three things are really critical for an investor. Number one, you have to have a certain level of intelligence. But there are people that are far uh, smarter than I am at this, uh, and, and, and I do better than they do in investing, because two other things are c- critical, courage and humility. You've got to be comfortable taking risk. Investing in growth stocks is, is a venture into the unknown. And you've also got to be humble because you're going to be wrong a lot. And if you're wrong, you want to make sure that you cut those losses. So we believe that, you know, research and process are a means to an end, which is um, performance is the end. Uh, But without the research and a good process and a good team, you're not going to get good performance in any sustainable manner. Exactly. So let's go to one of these lar- the larger uh, secular trends that's going on right now, uh, the tech revolution. W- w- what are you seeing here? Well, this is just fascinating to, to be investing at this time in the history of mankind. There has never been a revolution this powerful. We had the fossil fuel revolution, which is 250 years old, which uh, brought us nice things like toilets and hot showers and air conditioners and cars. Right. And the revolution of the brain really began in the, you know, the mid-1900s. And uh, what's going on now is we continue to achieve exponential gains in processing. So in 2001, $1,000 of computing power bought you an insect brain. In 2010, it bought you the equivalent of a, a mouse brain. But in 2023, $1,000 of computing power is going to buy you the equivalent of a human brain. And by 2050, it will buy you the equivalent of all human brains. So we have essentially the creation of infinite brain power, which in and of itself, plus a token, will get you on the subway. But what it does do it is is that it enables that brain power to be converted to real world opportunities and so we didn't even have an in, and this is all very recent we didn't even have an internet until 1996 it was not available to the public uh, until then and in a mere 20 years we have these enormous uh, outgrowths of the internet e-commerce social networks cloud computing And right around the corner are 5G and artificial intelligence. So I think the tech revolution will go gangbusters for another 100 years. Um, And what it's doing is two important things. It's overcoming distance, space, and time. So when you uh, pull out your iPhone and place an order on Amazon, you don't go to the mall. You save the distance, the space, and the time. And Mm -hmm. I ask myself, well, why won't uh, retail be 100% e-commerce down the road a long time. Um, The the, the second thing it's doing is it's beginning to automate uh, what we humans do. Um, And what what we humans do is both things that we do mentally and physically. And the mental part, uh, the tech revolution is having a faster influence on. But the physical part, it's going to take longer, but it will happen. Things like robotics and autonomous vehicles those will be the big growth areas maybe in 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, the big growth I- are in these areas like e-commerce, uh, social networks, and cloud computing. And it, all of this provides a tailwind for growth and keeps inflation under control. I think a fair argument could be made that 2% inflation is overstated because we're not really uh, calculating the deflationary effects of the tech revolution. For example, if this uh, a new iPhone costs $800, in 1985 it would have cost $40,000 if it had all the functionality, yet we don't measure that deflationary 
power of the tech revolution. And then on the, on the negative side, it's destroying business at, uh, at a much faster rate. Polaroid was a 24 billion, uh, Kodak was a $24 billion market cap company in 1998, and it was bankrupt in 2012. And the company wow. that helped slay it, Instagram, was sold a year later for a billion dollars. It only had 13 employees and was 18 months old. So the power of the tech revolution and the destruction that it's causing is is grossly underestimated, in my view. Now, th there's a, another interesting concept that uh, you use and, and your team uses to help select stocks, and that's uh, human motivation and, and using the Maslow theory of, of human motivation as a guide. Why don't you talk a little bit about this? You, you have an article on, on Lord Abbott. Uh, that that you wrote a, a little while ago, and it's absolutely fascinating. But it's it's talking about a lot of the concepts uh, that you've already spoken about. Well, <clears throat> when you think when you're investing in stocks that are benefiting from the technology revolution, um, you want to go where the money is, and yeah. our economy is seventy percent consumer. That's historically unique. Um, we only spend fifteen percent of the economy on things like tech equipment and software, et cetera. So there's plenty of great opportunities in software, but most of it is in the consumer and in mm -hmm. healthcare because uh, healthcare spending is part of the consumer spending. And, and so what, what, what happens here is the infinite brain power is being converted to real economic opportunity in consumer um, by and, and we focus on the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and we, we always ask ourselves, how is this going to uh, be something that consumers really want and need? Uh, because otherwise, how can it really be big? And so the, the layers of the, of the ha uh, hierarchy of needs are at the bottom, the physiological needs. Uh, we need to eat. We'd like the, the food and beverages to be at the right temperature. Um, you know, we, we have all, all we want to be, um, uh, you know, we, we have a need for a hot meal tonight. So if we can get that um, from a food delivery service, that's much better than if we have to go to the restaurant and sit there or call and walk down and pick it up. Right. Uh, so all of these things are targeted to the physiological level. Then there's the safety level. So you, you know, all of the um, security software stocks and all of the, uh, you know, security identification stocks of, of consumers to protect your identity and your privacy, all of that is addressing the burglar alarm uh, business. All of that is addressing the safety level. Then we move up to love and belonging. We have a massive uh, domesticated animals industry in the United States. We have 100 million uh, cats and dogs. Um, we spend billions on them uh, so because they solve our need for belonging. Love is very important. It's far better if you can find a partner. Uh, in life. Uh, and then we move up to self-esteem. Uh, many of the great apparel companies uh, have become so large because people like to wear nice clothes and like to see other people see that they have nice clothes, that they're successful enough that they can afford nice clothes. Companies that straighten teeth um, um, address the issue of, uh, of self-esteem. Uh, companies that run fitness centers address the need for self-esteem. And then at the very top is the self-actualization level. And, and, um, and that is, is, you know, reaching your potential. That's why the social networks have uh, become so massive. Um, you know, people become famous overnight because of the social networks. So, um, all, you know, we have a mobility boom going on. Uh, we, the, the value of entertainment is mushrooming. All of these things are creatively developed businesses with products and solutions and services to be paid for by consumers. Um, we have in the, in the medical area, we have much better drugs today in, in biotechnology. The, the, the human genome we, we didn't know what cancer was until 1965. We didn't know that we caused it until 1977. We didn't right. know what the, you know, how it really was caused until we mapped the genome in 2003. 
and we didn't get the genome down below 10,000 until 2010. So the modern-day biotech industry is less than 10 years old, and the drugs are vastly better than those of the big pharmaceutical companies. We have digital payments now, uh, which are far more convenient. You take a cab, you don't have to worry about having the right change. It's all on, on your credit card. You can hit the button to pay the tip. Um, and so all of this is, is the way in which the technology revolution is expressing itself in an economic sense. So remember to pay attention to the bigger picture. We have a massive tech revolution going on, and new companies are continuing to emerge to take advantage of these changes. Coming up next, we're going to talk about a few current stocks that are on the radar. Stay tuned. Want to stay on top of the market action? Get free investing newsletters in your inbox every day from IBD. Our market prep newsletter gets you ready before the opening bell and gives you the day's highlights after the close. The Tech Report is a daily rundown of top performing tech stocks making headlines. And the How to Invest newsletter, it's going to give you new tips every week on how to improve your returns. Go to Investors.com newsletters to sign up for free today. Tom O'Halloran is our guest on Investing with IBD. Uh, we've learned how huge this tech revolution is and how it's just beginning. Now, Tom, let's talk about some current stocks that are on the radar. Uh, the first stock that's up is a Mercado Libre, ticker symbol M-E-L-I. Yep. Uh, this is the number one e-commerce company in Latin America. Um, they have uh, 250 million users approximately in 20 different countries, and um, Latin America is a, is a booming e-commerce market. It is where the United States was in the, United, in the year 2000, um, mm -hmm. and it will advance as much in the next 18 to 19 years as ours advanced here. Internet access is growing, incomes are growing, and in many instances, consumers will just go straight to e-commerce, and 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 not go through stores like uh, like like we have done for years in Latin America. So their business is growing at about thirty percent per year over the past five years. It's it's volatile from year to year because of currency movements. They were in Venezuela. They got out of there. So there, there will be some volatility in the growth rate. But what's, what's, what's exciting not only about their e-commerce opportunity is their re relatively recent expansion into digital payments through their mer Mercado um, uh, Pago um, uh, business. And uh, PayPal, which is a leading payment processor in the uh, United States, uh, invested $750 million uh, in Mercado Libra to assist in this effort. And wow. digital payments is even uh, less uh, developed in Latin America than e-commerce. And when I look at the payment stocks from small cap to mega cap, they are absolutely some of the very best businesses of all. They have annuity-like revenues um, and there's, there's, there's a multitude of them. Uh, Annuity-like revenues, very high profit margins. So what Mercado Libra has done is moved into a new huge growth opportunity and one in which uh, the, some of the very best business models can be formed. So this is a, a long tail growth opportunity. This is not going to be a value. This is not a value stock. This is a uh, an expensive stock, but it's been expensive since 2009. Mm -hmm. um, it's gone from, you know, maybe $40 a share up to 625 today. And yeah. as I look forward, uh, or thereabouts, as I look forward over the next 10 years, I think it can grow 20% a year just because uh, e-commerce and digital payments are in such a nascent state and have the potential to be so much bigger, and this is the best horse to ride. Very good management. Um, and profits are depressed, as they are in some of the other growth companies, because they're investing heavily. But the business will yield very good uh, profits in the future, as e-commerce and payment processing company businesses do here. So, um, you know, a, a great long-term holding, in my view, Mercado Libra, stock symbol M-E-L-I. 
Now, you, you spoke about before where the company sometimes could be great, but the stock might not be great at that point. Well, Mercado Libre, they broke out of a, a large consolidation back on February 27th. And now that momentum ha has been there for the last four months. So it, it's starting to, the market's starting to recognize a lot of the potential for this stock. It, it's in a nice, solid uptrend. Um, and, you know, we like to see that. Uh, when that when that happens, we generally hold on for the ride. Now let's go to the second stock. And this is uh, Match.com, ticker yep. symbol MTCH. Yep. And they have a, a number of different dating sites, but their their big one is uh, Tinder. Yep. So e, you know, Mercado Libra is is benefiting from the e-commerce boom. Match. dot com is benefiting from the social network boom. Right. Um, and I said before, it's it's very important to to find a a partner in life, or or to you know, if you want to date, that's fine too. But it's, it's a very important thing, and the online uh, social network dating sites offer a vastly superior solution. Um, and you don't have the benefit of the filtering of friends, but through artificial intelligence, they will get it even better than friends in the future. But there, there has been just an explosion uh, in the interest of um, uh, dating sites. Um, I've never been on one. I don't ever intend to go on one. I'm happily married for 36 uh, years. Uh, but um, I can see where the trends are going. And uh, this company has a good lineage. <clears throat> uh, this company is part of Interactive uh, Corporation. And Barry Diller, um, who I think is a consumer internet genius, Mm -hmm. um, is really, you know, behind the scenes. Um, he's got great people running Match, but uh, whenever anything, uh, whenever I see anything that he's talking about on consumer internet, I always read it <clears throat> uh, because he's he, he's really uh, exceptionally able in this area. And Match has two offerings. <clears throat> One is free, um, and that is paid for by advertising. And then subscription, and the subscription offering is about fifteen dollars a month, and that gives you uh, uh, a much better connection with potential um, partners. Um, and you can both swipe if you like each other, and it just it, it's a it's a far better solution to getting a date and beginning a relationship. <clears throat> and um, you know, Tinder is the, uh, they have a number of properties, and what's very interesting to watch here with the dating sites is how they are evolving in a specialty sense. Um, and, um, you know, these have been around uh, since uh, the beginning of the Internet, but uh, mm. the social networks didn't really take off until Facebook was formed in 2006. Hard to believe uh um, you know, that it was that recent. And, and then, you know, Match um, uh, has become the leader in, uh, in the dating site social network business. And I just think they have huge potential. I, they, they only have 9 million paying subscribers, and there are some 300 million paying subscribers potentially in the world. So I ask, they've got 9 million now, why won't they have 100 million down the road sometime? So again, another long-tailed growth opportunity. They're moving internationally now. Their Asia-Pacific business is 10 times larger than it was four years ago. Wow. They're growing 20%. <clears throat> Their profit margins are very nice at 30%. And as is the case for Mercado Libra, it's in a nice, healthy stock uptrend. Um, and you know we're we're you know we're very flexible with with positions. We can move them up and down in size. Um, we get out of them if if they're not wor if they're going if a stock goes up tenfold, and then is going to go down fifty percent. We just as soon check out f until it resumes its uptrend. But yeah. but today match is is you know sailing uh, ahead very nicely as a stock and. The business is very healthy, so uh, uh, we like it. And it well, well, a couple of things there. Now, you you mentioned about position sizing. So usually, what what are the typical percentage for position sizing in your funds? Well, there there are absolute 
position sizes and relative position sizes. Um, okay. You know, so the number of stocks that we own in the micro cap growth fund, for example, would be about 80. Uh, in the small cap strategy, it would be about 90. And in the large cap strategy, about 75. And in the focus fund, about 33. And um, so mathematically, 33%, uh, 33 names is an average position size of three and a, and a, and a, and a third percent. Okay. Uh, for a 90 uh, stock portfolio, something different. But uh, so there's an absolute position size, and those normally don't go north of 7% in a given name. Um, in the small cap fund, usually not more than three, and uh, two and a half, and in the micro, not, usually not more than three. But in the large cap strategy, you have uh, stocks that, that are big weights in the index. And so if company X is 5% in the index and you only own 3%, even though 3% is a good size absolute position, you are underweight uh, relatively, relative to your, right. your index. So uh, position sizes you know, depend upon um, fundamental conviction, depend upon technical health, and uh, depend upon relative exposures. So if we own a small cap fund, for example, and we do own a number of them, in our large cap strategy, typically um, you will have a small weight in the index. Uh, in the Russell 1000 growth, a small cap company will be maybe 10 basis points or less. And so if we own 2%, that's a, that's a, a, you know, a very big active weight, even though we might own a company at 4%, but it's 3% in the index. It's, it's so, so it's a, it's a relative and an absolute, uh, position sizing, but, you know, we, we own 200 stocks across the three, 200 individual unique names across these three strategies. There's overlap. So, when somebody says, what is your favorite single stock, I, I, I scratch my head and have a hard time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so let's go to the third stock, uh, ServiceNow, <clears throat> another great tech company here. Yep. Well, <clears throat> ServiceNow is benefiting from the third mega trend of the tech revolution, which is cloud software. And this is pretty incredible. When I started in the business, <clears throat> um, in 1988, my computer plugged into the wall and was connected with nothing else. And then eventually we, um, we had these routers in the water cooler room that connected everybody on the floor. And then Cisco came along and yeah. connected the whole, uh, connected all computers. And then Qualcomm came along and connected, you know, computers wirelessly. And then in 1996, the government commercialized the internet. And that led to things like search and e-commerce, social networks. But the third big thing that it gave rise to is cloud software. <clears throat> now, when I started in the business in 1988, the software that ran every company in Manhattan was in the basement of the building or in the office itself, yes. dispersed across millions of locations. <clears throat> and then in the, you know, around the turn of the century, some internet pioneers had the wisdom to say, well, we don't need to do that anymore. We can put the software on the internet itself onto a common platform, which became called the cloud. Mm -hmm. And this enabled a huge revolution in software. It used to be that you had to wait 18 months for the consultants to come in to upgrade it. It was basically stale for 18 months. Yeah, <clears throat> but and with, you were captive to them too. Yeah, 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 that's right. That. But with cloud computing, it's it's instantaneously upgradable every day, every moment. Um, and um, the other thing that it did was it enabled the software to be delivered by subscription. And I said a moment earlier that annuity business models are what we look for. An, uh, it's amazing how much more people will pay for a business that is steady every year than one that is volatile up and down. And so we have the, that gave rise to a new term called SaaS, Software as a Service. And the third thing that, that this cloud uh, software revolution did was it enabled the creation of incredibly specialized software. So you had, you started out with operating system software, and then you had sales software, and then you had running the company software. You have customer relationship software, you have cost management software. 
there are now, you know, 25 great software stocks out there. And one of them is ServiceNow. Uh, and ServiceNow is basically digitizing all of the internal parts of a business. So the customer service, the, uh, I, the technology department, the human resource department, the security of the enterprise, they even put it on a dashboard. So it's all there and you can manage all of it from one spot. And what right. this does is makes business, uh, businesses much more efficient and much more agile. And ServiceNow is, is the king right now of digitizing the internal operations of businesses. And this is very early on. Uh, businesses that are, that are all digital in terms of the, the, the workflows are going to be vastly better than those that are old world. And ServiceNow is doing a very good job of what we call landing and expanding. So they land a lot of new customers. Many are one of the biggest new customer areas is the government <clears throat> for them. And uh, expanding, meaning that they'll get uh, business with a client and then they'll sell them more and more modules um, and grow that way. They have a very high retention of customers because this is very sticky once yeah, you set up, in. once once yeah. uh, the, once they're using that service and they see how simple <clears throat> simple it is, they're locked in. They're locked in, and this company, even though it's now uh, big, is still growing thirty five percent a year, and it's very profitable at twenty two percent profit margins. Those profit margins, if you look at other software businesses, could double over the next, you know, ten years. So, uh, and and like. Uh, Mercado Libra, Melly, stock symbol, like Match.com, MTCH, ServiceNow, uh, which has the stock symbol NOW, now, um, is a good stock now. It's in a nice yeah. uptrend. And, yep. um, and so those are three stocks of the 200 that we own that um, look like they're set up well at the moment. Yeah, perfect. They're, they're all trending nicely. They're all above their 50-day moving average. And they continue to work as long as the market works. So keep an eye on these current stocks and remember that we have a massive tech revolution going on and we're currently in uptrend. Thanks, Tom, so much for being on the show. Thanks, Arusha. It was great. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week on Investing with IBD. Next week, I'm going to be out, but we're going to have Chris Gessel, Chief Content Officer, and Justin Nielsen, Director of Market Research, on the show. I'm Arusha Pierce, and thanks for listening. And for this week's Nilton Charts, make sure to go to Investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.